Ashtotra Shatta Shri Simar's Divine Grace, Iskan Founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki, Gauda Premanandi. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, chapter 8, text 1. Rajavacha. Brahmana Chorito Brahman Gunakyane Gunasyacha Yasma Yasma Yata Praha Nardo Deva Darshanaha Rajavata Brahmana Chorito Brahman Gunakyane Gunasyata Yasma Yasma Yata Praha Narado Deva Darshanaha Please chant. Gunakyane Gunasyata Naru Deva Darshanaha Ramana Chodito Brahman Gunakyane Gunasyata Yasmayasayata Praha Nardo Deva Darshanaha Marjis Radha, the king, Uvacha, inquired, Brahmana, by Lord Brahma, Chodita, being instructed, Brahman, O learned Brahman, Shukadeva Goswami, Guna Akyane, in narrating the transcendental qualities, Agunasya, of the Lord, who is without material qualities, cha, and yasmai yasmai, and whom, yata, as much as, praha, explained, nardaha, nardamuni, deva darshanaha, one whose audience is as good as that of any demigod. 
translation purport by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Oh, no. Thank you very much, Maharaj. King Parikit inquired from Shukadeva Goswami, how did Narada Muni, whose hearers are as fortunate as those instructed by Lord Brahma, explain the transcendental qualities of the Lord, who is without material qualities, and before whom did he speak? To the Prabhupada's purport, Devarshi Narada was directly instructed by Brahmaji, who is also directly instructed by the Supreme Lord. Therefore, the instructions imparted by Narada to his various disciples are as good as those of the Supreme Lord. That is the way of understanding Vedic knowledge. It comes down from the Lord by disciplic succession, and this transcendental knowledge is distributed to the world by this descending process. There is no chance, however, to receive the Vedic knowledge from mental speculators. Therefore, wherever Narada Muni goes, he represents himself as authorized by the Lord, and his appearance is as good as that of the Supreme Lord. Similarly, the disciplic succession, which strictly follows the transcendental instruction, is the bona fide chain of disciplic succession. And the test for, those, for such bona fide spiritual masters is that there should be no difference between the instructions of the Lord originally imparted to his devotee and that which is imparted by the authority in the line of disciplic succession. How Narada Muni distributed the transcendental knowledge of the Lord will be explained in later cantos. It will also, it will appear also that the Lord existed prior to the material creation. And therefore his transcendental name, quality, etc. do not represent any material quality. Whenever, therefore, the Lord is described as aguna or without any quality, it does not mean that he has no quality, but that he has no material quality, such as the modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance, as the conditioned souls have. He is transcendental to all material conceptions, and thus he is described as aguna. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjala Shalakaya Chakshun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha So here, the purity of the message is being described, or how the purity is maintained, is through the unbroken disciplic succession. And we find that religious systems that don't have such a disciplic succession get watered down over time. So Vaishnavas are very careful about maintaining the purity of the knowledge. And so therefore, we always repeat just exactly what our spiritual master has said. And that maintains the uh, unadulterated message coming down into civic succession. The materialists would find this a bit on the boring side. Why can't we invent something new? <laughs> So we have to analyze why they need to invent something new is because they're very bored. Is because material existence is inherently uh, unsatisfying to the spirit soul. And since the spirit souls are out of place in the material world, they always have to, they're always scrambling and, and uh, frantically maneuvering to try to get some, some juice out of this material energy, which is a futile endeavor because the juice is very limited. It's extremely limited. So therefore, they always have to have new cars, new computers, new this, new that. But for devotees, we don't need something new because the, the purity, the power of the message itself, the transcendental nature of Krishna and his loving exchanges with his pure devotees is so inherently satisfying to the soul that we're happy to, as it is. We don't need something new all the time. We see this in the lives of exalted pure devotees. They can sit down anywhere at any time and become totally satisfied just by hearing and chanting about Krishna. We find in the six Goswamis in Vrindavan, Raghunath Das Goswami is just sitting by Radha Kund for 40 years, simply chanting the holy names of the Lord, offering obeisances to the Vaishnavas, and speaking about the latter pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which he was privy to in Jagannath Puri, in which the other devotees of Vrindavan did not know and wanted to hear. Actually, Raghunath Das Goswami was devastated, as were all the devotees, after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's departure. 
So they thought, what's the purpose of being on this planet when Lord Chaitanya has left? So Raghunath Das Goswami decided to go to Vrindavan and give up his life by jumping off Govardhan Hill. It's one of the two methods, approved methods of suicide for saintly persons. The other being throwing yourself under the wheels of Lord Jagannath's cart, which Sanatana Goswami had decided to do at one point, and which Lord Chaitanya instructed him not to do. In any case, Raghunath Das Goswami came to Vrindavan with that intention. However, the Vaishnavas there said, wait a minute, you know about all the pastimes. You, for 18 years you've been with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Jagannath Puri seeing his Anchalila, which is very confidential. All the devotees wanted to be with Lord Chaitanya, but he sent them away to preach. He allowed them to come only for limited times. But Raghunath Das Goswami and Ramananda Roy and uh, Srup Damanar were so privileged, they had such special grace from the Lord, they were allowed to stay with Lord Chaitanya and see his incredible ex exhibition of Viraha Bhav or Vipralamba and all the wonderful activities he performed there. So the devotees wanted to know about that. The great Vrindavan Das Thakur had compiled Chaitanya Bhagavat, which concentrates on the Navadripa earlier leelas. However, the latter pastimes were not well known. So the devotees ordered Raghunath Das Goswami, specifically Rupan and Sanatan, who were the leaders of the Vaishnavas there in Raj, ordered Raghunath Das Goswami to recite what he knew of the pastimes for the next, for many years, three hours a day. So the devotees would all assemble and listen to him speak. And in that assembly, was Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami. And he was chosen to compile the latter pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu into the Chaitanya Charitamrita. He actually received the title Kaviraj not for the composition of Chaitanya Charitamrita, which certainly would give anyone the right to be glorified as Kaviraj or best of poets, but it turns out that Krishnas Kaviraj Goswami was awarded the title Kaviraj because of his composition of Govinda Lilamrita, his earlier composition, which describes the Ashtakalya Lila of Shishi Radha and Krishna. So that's a very amazing, it's very advanced, very exalted literature. And that got him the, the accolade of all the Vaishnavas and the, and the title of Kaviraj. So he was selected. They were wondering who should actually write this incredible literature, Chaitanya Charitamrita. So he was selected to do that. So the, the, for Vaishnavas, we are simply interested in following the, the transcendental sound vibration given by the previous Acharyas, because that is unlimitedly satisfying in, our, in and of itself. If we're rightly situated in devotional service, we will find that although we're chanting the same mantra all the time. So the materialist would say, oh, it's just the same thing all the time. So that must be terribly boring. But actually, if we're rightly situated in devotional service, every Hare Krishna and Ram is a window into the spiritual world. Rightly situated means we're serving our spiritual master properly. So then Krishna is pleased. And so when you chant Krishna's name, what you experience depends on how much Krishna is pleased with your service attitude and your, your entire devotional mood. So if we're rightly situated, every time you chant the holy name, you get a deeper experience of it. Although it externally seems like the same words or the same sound, because of the magical potency of Krishna, that sound becomes more intense, more deep, more, you're elevated to a more intimate, loving relationship with Krishna. The same is true of Srimad Bhagavatam or all the transcendental literatures. We may be hearing the same pastime. We may have heard the, the killing of Denu a million times, but it's ever fresh. This is the magical potency of devotional service. And more than just being ever fresh, it's ever fresh for neophyte devotees, but for advanced devotees, it's more than ever fresh. It's actually the ultimate goal. Hearing about Krishna's pastimes for a very exalted Vaishnavas like Haridas Thakur and Rupa Goswami, they go into trance, they actually see the pastimes. Simply meditating on the pastimes, they're actually there, they're experiencing the pastimes. Not only that, but in their perfectional body, their siddhadeya, they're performing service to
to the Lord in that perfected state. So that's, that's the ultimate experience in devotional service, is to be so advanced that when you simply hear anything about Krishna, it, it, you go into a deep trance and you have an internal rich life in which you're experiencing Krishna. You're experiencing Krishna to the ultimate degree. So this is what we're striving for, and it's very inspiring for us to hear about these exalted devotees and how they serve Krishna. And of course, Chaitanya Leela is rich with such exalted devotees. We can begin with Mukunda, described in Madhula chapter 15. Mukunda was a pure devotee of Lord Chaitanya, Nityasiddha, and his service was to sing for Lord Chaitanya. When he would sing, all the devotees, Lord Chaitanya and all the devotees, their hearts would melt in ecstasy. He was famous as a singer. He was also a physician, and he was, had a good friendly relationship with a Mohammedan king. So one day they were sitting up on a high platform discussing medical treatments, and it was a hot day, so the king's uh, servant brought a peacock fan to shade the head of the king. And Mukunda is so exalted, just seeing the peacock fan, just peacock feathers, he immediately remembered Krishna. And so he went into complete ecstatic trance and he fell off from the high platform down onto the ground. And because the king had a very friendly relationship with the king, personally descended to revive his physician. And he asked Mukunda, what happened to you? What, what, what's, what's the problem? And... Uh, Mukunda said, well, I have this disease that's like epilepsy, so I, sometimes I lose control of my body and I just fall onto the ground. <laughs> However, the king was highly intelligent. He did not accept that explanation. Prabhupada writes, in his estimation, Mukunda was the most exalted, liberated devotee of the Lord. So the devotee himself never advertised himself. This is a symptom of exalted Vaishnava. He, didn't, he could have said, Actually, I'm a great devotee and I went into trance. He could have said that, and it would have been true, but that's not how devotees operate. So he made up some story. Also, Lord Chaitanya would, would say that when he was uh, surrounded by the Patan Muslims, is another interesting pastime in Majuli, chapter 18. The Patans were Muslims, and apparently they were pretty aggressive. They rode around with weapons, and they, uh, as they were out, Riding around, they happened to come across Lord Chaitanya and four of his associates. And uh, at that point, Lord Chaitanya, he had he'd come to Vrindavan. When Lord Chaitanya was elsewhere, simply the name of Vrindavan was enough to put him into to the topmost spiritual ecstasy. But when he was actually traveling in Vrindavan itself and seeing the various holy places, he was completely absorbed. He was rolling on the ground in ecstasy. And the four devotees were taking care of him. These were Rajput Krishnadas, a Kshatriya who had lived in the area and just met Lord Chaitanya recently, Balabhadra Bhattachari, his traveling companion from Bengal, uh, an assistant Brahmin whose name is never given, and the fourth person was... Somehow my memory is going out. Can someone help me? On the fourth of those four devotees. Anyway, those three for sure, and one other devotee was there. Oh, the other devotee was the Sanudiya Brahman, that's right, the disciple of Madhavendra Puri, who met up with Lord Chaitanya when Lord Chaitanya came. So these were four devotees traveling with Lord Chaitanya at the time in Sri Vrindavan Dham, and the Muslims rode up. Lord Chaitanya had just fainted, which he was doing all the time, and the Muslims, within their mind, they actually concocted an interesting scenario so they accused the four devotees. Lord Chaitanya was laying on the ground in ecstasy. The four devotees were standing there. Uh, and the Muslims rode up, at least ten of them. They dismounted and they threatened the devotees. They said, you four are rogues. You have given, and they even concocted the name of the poison, Dutura. They had, within their rich imagination, they had calculated that the four devotees had actually given poison to Lord Chaitanya with the intention of robbing him. Now, as they were announced the Nasi, I don't know what they were seeking to rob, so it was, didn't seem to be a very rational scenario. But in any case, they were serious about punishing the, what they thought were four dacoits. So they said, we're going to kill you. And uh, the Sanudiya Brahmin, he was fearless, so he said, uh, 
why don't you just wait a little bit and when this sannyasi regains his sense, we're actually his devotees and he doesn't own anything, so you're, you, you're a little bit in inaccurate in your analysis. But if you don't believe me, just wait a little bit, he'll regain his external sense, then you can question us, question the sannyasi, and then if you like, you can kill us all. <laughs> Sounds pretty rational, isn't it? But they were not pacified by that. So, they, uh, they were uh, getting ready to actually kill the devotees. Now, Rajput Krishnadas was a kshatriya by nature and naturally fearless. So he said, I have 200 Turkish cannons, 200 Turkish soldiers and cannons nearby. If I call loudly, they'll come and kill you. <laughs> so that got, the, the threat of force was enough to, they were sort of hesitating, wondering what to do. And, uh, but still they were convinced that the devotees were rascals. They said, you are from, uh, you're, you're local, you live here in, in Vrajnam. Uh, Balabhadra Vajachai and his assistant Brahman are quivering in fear, two Bengalis. Uh, so they said, uh, you guys are all rascals, we're going to kill you. But just at that moment, just when the debacle would have occurred, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu regained his external senses and began dancing and chanting the holy names in, very loudly in ecstasy. And the Muslims were all struck with wonder. They had never seen such genuine ecstatic emotions. They couldn't really understand what Lord Chaitanya was doing, but they were very, very impressed by him. So then they came to him uh, with great respect and they said, you know, here are four rascals, they were trying to rob you. <laughs> and Lord Chaitanya said, no, sorry, you got it wrong. These are my associates. They are my loving companions. And then among these Muslims was one dressed in black. He was a saintly Muhammad and he had studied the Quran very seriously and he was practicing austerities for God, for impersonal realization. And so he wanted to have a discussion with Lord Chaitanya about the Quran and about impersonalism versus personalism. So it's, there's a kind of humorous element because he's speaking to God himself but trying to convince God that there's no God and that actually everything is ultimately impersonal. So they began the discussion and the interesting thing about this discussion, revealed in Majulia chapter 18, is that Lord Chaitanya did not argue on the strength of any of Vedic literature. He was so expert. Of course, in his youth, he was the greatest scholar. So he argued, it says he argued on the basis of the Quran to prove that devotion, personal devotion to a personal God is the ultimate teachings of the Quran. And he actually convinced the saintly Muslim. And the saintly Muslim Put forth, but first he put forth various arguments, impersonal arguments. Lord Chaitanya defeated them all on the basis of the Quran. Then, during the course of the discussion, he was enchanted by the Lord's personal beauty and impressed by the Lord's erudition. So he decided that uh, he was actually speaking to God. <laughs> he realized how foolish it was to convince, try to convince God that there's no God. And he fell down, he surrendered. He did the right thing. He fell down at the lotus feet of the Lord, fully surrendered his life. Lord Chaitanya blessed him and, and initiated him. Changed, he actually, Lord Chaitanya changed his name to Ram Das and initiated him on the spot. And he was in, in ecstasy. And then another of these Muslims, the, head, the leader of them was the prince. And his name was Vijuli Khan. And he was also overwhelmed. He was so enchanted by the personal qualities of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he also fell down at the lotus feet of the Lord. The Lord directly put his lotus foot on his head and he became mad with ecstatic love. And then Lord Chaitanya ordered all the Bhutan Muslims to chant the holy name of Hari, which they did, and then they all became overwhelmed with ecstasy. And they were immediately transformed on the spot into pure devotees of the Lord. This is the amazing nature of Gaur Lila, Chaitanya Lila is that he's freely giving out to everybody, even persons who were of a low caliber, low quality. He was giving ecstatic love of God to everyone. Therefore, Prabodhananda Saraswati Thakur, in his Chaitanya Chandram Rita, is so overwhelmed with Lord Chaitanya's mercy, he says, so what if, if Lord Nisringadev killed the mighty Asura, Hiranyakashmi? So what if Lord Ramchandra slew the, the great uh, Rakshasha Ravana. The real thing, what's really going on is Lord Gora and Nityananda giving out freely ecstatic love of God to everyone. 
without considering qualifications. So he's, he's a pure devotee. Actually, according to the Gaura Ganadesha Deepika, Prabodhananda Saraswati Thakur is none other than Tunga Vidya, one of the Ashtasakis, the eight most intimate friends of Sri Radhika. This book, Gaura Ganadesha Deepika, is very interesting. Deepika means light. It sheds light on the associates of Gauranga and who they are in other leelas. Most of them are gopas and gopis from Rajnam. A few of them, like Murari Gupta, is Hanuman himself. So the book, it, this authorized, fully authorized book, describes that these associates, these gopas and gopis, mostly they became brahmins and sannyasis and, and preachers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission. So Prabodhananda Saraswati, as a pure devotee, he can, he can even apparently appear to be minimizing the values of the other avatars of the Lord. He can do this out, out of his ecstasy, just as Sri Radhika could insult Krishna in various ways in the Brahmara Gita. Because pure devotees, they have the license, they have the right, the adhikar to do this. We have to be a little more cautious. We find exalted Vaishnavas in, their, in the ecstasy of their their mood of pure devotion, they can even appear to be minimizing the standard worshipable avatars of Vishnu, or Sri Radhika herself, she simply insulted Krishna. She said, she said Krishna is of low character, he's ungrateful. <clears throat> More than that, he, he cheated Bali Maharaj. She said in a previous life he was an, a Brahmin, known as Vamanev, and Bali Maharaj duly surrendered everything. He did the right thing, and still Krishna as Vamana was so ungrateful so hard-hearted, he pushed him down to the Patala region, even though he surrendered everything. What kind of, what, what kind of character is this, Sri Radhika is saying. <laughs> now, she didn't tell the full story, actually, because the Lord himself came as his doorman down to Sutala. So, Bali Maharaj was greatly rewarded by the Lord. He was tested, and apparently he was arrested with the ropes of Varuna, and apparently uh, mistreated by the Lord, but... He, after being tested, he was glorified and achieved a very wonderful position, and he will be the next Indra, in fact. So, Sri Radhika didn't tell the whole story. We didn't get the, from her, well, all we got the picture of is that Vamana, or Krishna as Vamana, is very ungrateful, very hard-hearted, very, very uh, not, not reciprocating properly, you know, he's not, not really doing what you're supposed to do. <laughs> but she didn't stop there. She said, in another previous life, he was Ram Chandra. And Shur Panaka, the sister of Ravana, approached him. And as a Kshatriya, apparently, Kshatriya is supposed to reciprocate. If a, if a, a maiden comes and, and begs for his shelter and for a relationship, he's supposed to have a relationship with her. But Radhika said that uh, Ram Chandra was so uh, henpecked by Sita Devi that he converted Shur Panaka into an ugly woman by slicing off her nose and ears. Srimati Radharani neglected to mention that Shurpanaka at that point had become aggressive and tried to kill Sita. So uh, Ramchandra ordered Lakshman to cut off her nose and ears. She probably should have been received a more serious penalty. So she got a very she got off lightly. And Ramchandra had a reason for doing it. That's the thing. But Radhika, just from Srimati Radharani's speech in the 47th chapter of the 10th canto, which is known as the Brahmara Gita. She did not mention these things. And she further went on to say Ramchandra, to challenge Ramchandra's character as a bona fide Kshatriya by saying that he killed Vali, the enemy of Sugriva, by, for, hiding behind a tree. He shot him with an arrow, and that's a no-no. You're supposed to face in battle, as a Kshatriya is supposed to face a, another Kshatriya in battle, in fair combat. But again, she, didn't, she neglected to mention that there were good reasons which are stated in the Ramayana. Ramchandra himself states them to Vali as Vali is dying. Ramchandra had, first Vali had abused his position as the elder brother of Sugriva and stolen his wife and mistreated Sugriva, beat him up severely and almost killed him. So that's, that's against the proper Vedic code. So Ramchandra informed Vali that he was... Do, he, was, he deserved the death penalty for his abuse of his younger brother and taking his wife. And Vali actually accepted that. And before he died, he apologized to Ramchandra. So, 
Sri Radhika didn't mention these. There were valid reasons for Ramchandra's behavior. Of course, how can there not be? Ramchandra was the, was the perfection of duty, the, that he had taken Ekapatni Vrata, so he could not reciprocate. Due to his vow, he could not reciprocate with Shur Panaka. But in fact, the Acharyas give further details because devotion is, never goes in vain that Shur Panaka actually performed great. She was very attracted to, to Lord Ramchandra. So she, when she was unable to have a relationship with him, she performed severe tapasya and later on prayed to Lord Shiva and Lord Shiva gave her the benediction that she would become Kubja in her next life. So she did get the mercy. She got, and Krishna reciprocated with her because devotion never goes in vain. So the pure devotees of the Lord are always satisfied simply by meditating on the pastimes of the Lord and, and chanting the holy name of the Lord. They don't need anything new. It is ever new and ever fresh in and of itself. So I think I'll stop at this point and ask if there are any questions or corrections. So, Brigupati Prabhu, he's also very senior, exalted. One of the few devotees in North America who's continuously distributed books for 45 or more years. That's pretty good qualification. <laughs> um, thank you for an amazing class. Really wonderful class. Uh, two small questions. One, um, that king that Mukunda Dat was serving, was he a... The king that Mukunda Dat was serving, was he a devotee or was he a Muslim? He was a Muslim, so he, but apparently devotee. Muslims, can, we don't, we're not sectarian. A Muslim can be a devotee. So he was able to his name was never given. His, his, it was not that he was Hussein Shah, the, a famous king of the time. That may, may have been, but he, his name was not given at least in that part of Chaitanya Chaitanya. So we do not know what his name was. All we know is he was extraordinarily intelligent, Prabhupada said. Because when Mukunda offered the explanation of epilepsy, he didn't accept it. He recognized this is a very advanced Vaishnava. So he was very intelligent. And he respected devotees, I guess, and that gives him the qualification of being a devotee of some sort. Mm -hmm. I don't know any more than what, what is stated there in the text. Okay. And on one occasion, Mukunda Dat was chastised by Lord Chaitanya because he had that habit of going around and hearing different people speak. Um, but that was just the Leela? That's in Chaitanya Bhagavat. Uh -huh. That's in the uh, Sapta Prahariya Leela, the, the ecstasy of 21 hours, where Lord Chaitanya satisfied all the devotees by revealing himself as Krishna, in this, as Lord Chaitanya, we know he generally did not, and never in public did he admit to being God. He, in fact, he denied it in public. And this particular Leela is the uh, Saptabharya Leela, the ecstasy of 21 hours, but in private, in the house of Srivast Thakur. There, because he loves to reciprocate with his devotees, the devotees wanted to worship him as God. So one day he'd walked up to the, to the altar of Srivast picked up the Shalagam Shilas, put him on his lap and sat on the throne and revealed himself most dramatically to various devotees as Krishna, as Ram, as various other avatars of the Lord, whoever they were attracted to. He wanted to please all the devotees. So he called for devotees. He called for Haridas Thakur. He called for, <coughs> for uh, Kolavetsa Sridhar and many other great devotees. He called for them and showed them the form of the Lord that they were attached to, the Ishtadev. And everyone is expecting, because Mukunda is a great devotee, everyone is expecting, and during the course of the great, of Lord Chaitanya calling for the various devotees, naturally, they would expect Mukunda should be called, but he wasn't. And they thought this was very anomalous, Srivas Thakur in particular. He said, oh Lord, you have called for all the devotees, why have you neglected Mukunda? And Lord Chaitanya said, I will not see the face of this rascal. When, when, when in association of devotees, he glorifies devotional service. But then he goes to a meeting of Mayavadis and, and glorifies, here's the Yoga Vashishta, and, and glorifies Mayavad uh, philosophy as superior to, to the devotional path. So he, with one hand he, he caresses me, and the other hand he smacks me with an iron rod. I will not see this, this rascal, Mukunda. So the devotees, Sri Vastaka was devastated. He said, we didn't know this. Well, we thought he's such a great devotee. We couldn't, couldn't understand this. And then, uh, I forget, someone asked him, 
I, they went to Mukunda and told us, and then Mukunda asked, when will I see the Lord? I'm, I'm, I'm a great offender, but when, when is there hope for me? So they went, they went back and asked Lord Chaitanya, when, can, when will you see Mukunda? And Lord Chaitanya, I will not see him for 10 million births. And that's pretty heavy. <laughs> but Mukunda being so exalted, he, he thought, well, great, at least I'm not gone forever. At least I'm not hopelessly lost, you know, for, for all time. At least there's a chance for me. In fact, I'm guaranteed to see the Lord. So he began dancing in ecstasy with such pure devotion and such a pure-hearted and simple mood and so humbly accepting the verdict of the Lord that Lord Chaitanya as I called. He said, come on, okay, you're, 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 you've pleased me by your devotion and your sacrifice and your surrender. You, you've pleased me. So he, uh, the Lord called for Mukunda and reinstated him and uh, glorified him as his eternal singer and said, whenever Mukunda sings, everyone's heart will melt, including my own. So that's described in Chaitanya Bhagavat. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's an important point that, that was <clears throat> realized, and this is what attracted uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu so strongly at that point where he actually uh, said to Mukunda, I'm very sorry. You know, I was just teasing you. I know what your position is, but I wanted to show other people what a real, true, deep, humble devotee is. So where is the humility? The humility is that Mukunda felt that he was not worthy of seeing him ever, and that this was a grace, this was a blessing, and consequently, uh, if it's two million years, that's nothing if you, if you don't deserve to see him at all. So that was the point of humility, that when a devotee comes in contact you know, with the uh, Supreme Lord, he doesn't feel that this is something he deserves, that he's worthy of. It's a grace. And when he has that position, uh, which Mukunda was showing, and therefore he was dancing that, as you were just mentioning, I'm going to see him. I'm going to see him. Even if it's two million years, what's the difference? It's such a rare, valuable, amazing uh, phenomenon to see God, you see. And this is a position, sometimes as a result of seeing someone regularly and often, we take it for granted and seem to think that, well, that's okay because I'm on a platform that I deserve to be there. Otherwise, he wouldn't let me be there. So uh, this was the point. So Lord Chaitanya said to him, no, uh, I will, you're like my favorite. You will, uh, the way you sing, you, you arouse such devotion, such love, and such <clears throat> tears from my eyes. Mukunda, you will always be mine. And it cleared the whole situation because people thought that, the devotees thought that Lord Chaitanya was being true, that uh, he, he didn't like Mukunda, but actually he loved him and he did this to show all of the devotees that this is the kind of humility. All of you who are sitting here should not think that you deserve it. This is his point. This is the arrogance. This is the ego. This is the... Uh, uh, th thought that uh, I'm so important, I'm so valuable, I've done so much great service. That has to be killed completely. Yes, thank you, Marsh. That's a very important aspect. And it's true that Lord Chaitanya was so impressed by humility as a quality of his devotees. When Kolavetra Sridhar, Hari Das Thakur, Murari Gupta, they exhibited such humility. In fact, with Hari Das Thakur, Lord Chaitanya said, it's too much. You're agitating my mind. It's too much humility because when Lord Chaitanya invited him to come to a meeting of all the devotees, Haridas Thakur would be out a hundred feet laying on, on the ground offering dhanavats. He said, I'm not qualified to see the Lord. So as you mentioned, that's, the, that's such a beautiful quality. We shouldn't take it for granted. We shouldn't think, oh, I'm a Vaishnav. I'm, I'm well situated. I deserve so much. But the real devotees are thinking, I don't deserve anything. I'm useless, I'm, I'm garbage, I'm lower than, than trash in the street. That's Haridas Thakur or, or, or Marari Gupta, they had this quality. And Lord Chaitanya was so pleased with this quality. He was so pleased, he said, I'm a, a, you are my favorite devotee. Favorite, why? Because, favorite, why? Because he felt himself so insignificant, unimportant, unvaluable. And all Hardas Thakur would say to him when Lord Chaitanya said, what would you like? He said, 
Help me to realize my unworthiness. That was the thing. It's so... And Krishna's coverage was told me, he writes in Chaitanya Charitamrita, anyone who speaks my name becomes sinful. Anyone who... What did he exactly say? I'm lower than a worm in stool. Anyone who, who speaks my name loses all the results of his pious activities. Something like that. He writes it directly in, in uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita. And it's not a false show. This is an important point, a final point. The, the, the pure devotees who are saying this, if, if I say it, it's like, you know, it's designed to, to evoke respect, you know, in, in a in Machiavellian strategy for, to acquire respect. But when they say it, they honestly, it's not dishonest. They're honestly believing I'm lower than a worm in stool. They honestly believe it. So the question arises, why do they honestly feel that? Is it, is it not a put on like I would do or someone else might do? Not at all. When you feel in that realization of your tininess, your smallness, your insignificance next to the Supreme Lord, how can you feel big, great, grand, amazing? You can't. Even if a million people say, you're great, you're wonderful, you're glorious, you're this, you're that. You forget that because next to Krishna, you're nothing. And the only reason that you have that is Krishna has given you a part of himself called grace. And therefore you appear whatever you have here. We have to design our life around the, the role models given to us in the Shastra. That's the key point. These are role, everyone has to have a role model. The materialists want to be like James Bond or somebody. <laughs> we, we, this is our role model is Murari Gupta, Haridas Thakur, Vasudev Dat, Mukunda. These truly, Krishna's God, these persons who, who are genuinely humble. It's not a false show. They genuine. they understand the, 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 the exalted nature of Krishna and his pure devotees. They think, I'm the lowest, I'm not even really a devotee. Haridas Thakur said, I'm just an imitation devotee. He says in, in Anchalila, chapter 11. When requesting of Lord Chaitanya that he be permitted to depart before the Lord leaves. He said, I'm just an imitation of There's so many devotees who are fit to sit on my head. He says there in Anjali chapter 11. This is our role. We need a role model and this is our role model. Are there any other questions or corrections for more advanced? If I made a mistake, please do not hesitate to correct me. You mentioned during the class that um, there was two bona fide ways for a Vaishnav to For Vaishnav suicide. suicide. And uh, so you mentioned about that Sanatana Goswami wanted to throw himself under the wheels of the Goth cart. What yeah. What's that all about? That's an Ancha 4. He had contracted some horrible disease and all kinds of itching sores, traveling through, retracing the path Lord Chaitanya had taken through Jai Khanda because he wanted to see all the places where Lord Chaitanya. So Sanatana Goswami, by the arrangement of the Lord, had contracted some nasty boils and there were, there were open sores with pus coming out. So he thought, I'm useless. What is, what is he? And worse than that, Lord Chaitanya would forcibly embrace him. He tried to run away. Can you imagine that? The divine form, the Satchit Ananda Vigraha, the form of the Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is embracing me you know, and I'm trying to run away and I can't escape because Lord Chaitanya is too powerful. So he thought, it's, it's useless. So he went to Jagannath Pan and he said, you know, my life is useless. I should, I, I, I should actually just throw myself under the cart. Lord Chaitanya is omniscient. So the next meeting he said, suicide is not going to get you where you want to go. I, Lord Chaitanya said, I would give up millions of bodies if I could get Krishna by suicide. No, you get Krishna by devotional service. But then Lord Chaitanya added something interesting after giving that basic philosophy. He said, an exalted devotee always wants to give up his... An exalted Vaishnava always wants to give up his body because he can't tolerate the pain of separation from the Lord. This is in Anchila chapter 4. Lord Chaitanya said. So he did say that actually devotees do aspire to give up their life. But he told Sanatana Goswami, in his case, he said, yeah, I have a lot of work to do through your body. You can't give up your body. My, in fact, your, your body is no longer your property. It's my property. You surrendered to me. Don't you understand? You turn to Haridas Thakur. Tell, her, tell him this, that you can't throw away his body because it's no longer his, his body. He's surrendered to me and I have a lot of stuff you have to do. You have to write various books, like Hari Bhakti Vilas and 
so many books you know, I have to write through you, Brihat Bhagavatam Rita, and you have to uncover the lost holy places of Raj. So you're not entitled to give up that body. But then Lord Chaitanya says, but it is the mood of a great devotee that he does. He cannot tolerate separation, so he does actually want to give up his body. And then when, he, when, that, when that intensity reaches such, when his devotion reaches such intensity, then Lord Chaitanya, appear, then the Lord appears in front of him. If I may, I've... I've yes, please add. Okay. So, um, so this is a for real question. Okay, so in that meeting... I don't know if it was in that same meeting, the Sata Puri, how do you say it? Meaning, Lord Chaitanya met with Vasudev Dat, and he was talking. And Vasudev Dat was is describing to Lord Chaitanya how he, um, he couldn't stand, you know, to see the sufferings of all the conditioned souls. Yes. And that he, was, he made a, uh, an appeal to Lord Chaitanya, please allow me to take the reactions to their sinful activities myself, and so that they can become liberated. And... Uh, Lord Chaitanya was very touched by that, you know, request, that, that sentiment. And he explained to um, Vasudev that, that actually very nice, but that's not necessary because Krishna's prime duty is to fulfill the desire of his pure devotees and you're his pure devotee. So even without you having to suffer the reactions to their sinful activities, they're already delivered because you're desiring their deliverance. So now in the present day, we have, you know, Srila Prabhupada was pure devotee. And he certainly was desiring the deliverance of the, you know, entire human race like that. But um, at least as of to date, we don't see it happening. So is it, how do we understand this? Is it a work in progress? Is it, you know, well, how do we understand that in, in light of that point that Krishna always wants to fulfill the desires of the pure devotee, what's going on in the world today? That is a very ad advanced question. I'm not qualified to answer. But as you hinted, a work in progress, it may be that that Krishna has decided to satisfy Srila Prabhupada's desire by setting up the, the, the arrangement so everyone can become Krishna conscious over a period of several lifetimes. You know, by ISKCON's preaching, people will become Krishna conscious and go back to Godhead. Maybe not immediately. See, in Gaur Leela directly, there were, there were immediate results, magical and immediate, like the Patan Muslims are immediately transformed into pure devotees. Or Lord Nityananda transformed the, the thieves and rascals, the rogues who tried to rob him. Immediate. And, and Rindavan Das Thakur says they got Vraj Prem. They didn't just become struggling neophytes, having trouble getting up from Mangalartik or chanting 16 rounds. They received the, the mercy from Nityananda, they received the, the, the bhav of the gopis and gopas of Vraj Dham. So during Gaur Leela, immediate things would happen. Lord Chaitanya would embrace someone, and it instantly, like the son of Maharaj Prataparudra, he said he was an ordinary prince, it says there in Madhuri 12. Next day he became. Immediately, as soon as Lord Chaitanya embraced him, he became topmost Vaishnava. So when the Lord himself is on the planet, immediate miracles occur. And when he's not on the planet, like we're, we're also offered the chance to go back to God, but we have to do sadhana. We have to, to preach the mission of the Lord. We have to do various austerities and things. They were, it's not handed to us instantly, but still you could say that the mercy is still there. It's just not immediate. So you, you yourself stated that it's a work in progress. But I'm not qualified to, to state directly that because I, I don't know what that is. I haven't seen it in Shastra, how the Lord intends to satisfy Prabhupada's desires. We know that Prabhupada, when he came to America, he prayed on the Jaladutta. And then many people, like, I don't even know how I became a devotee. <laughs> many of us might also have that feeling. Like, I wasn't really very devoted. You know, I wasn't even religious. I didn't like religion. <laughs> How do we become devotees? Prabhupada's mercy. So that's pretty impressive. That's something, you know. That's that's, that's damn impressive, actually. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, that there's two bona fide ways, that, two bona fide ways to for suicide. But I I also heard that pure devotee can also drown himself in the Ganges. And Shri Prabhupada mentioned that. Vishnu John Swami heard that, and then there's some speculation that he actually. Well, that's the way. If you if a sannyasi falls down, the atonement is to drown yourself at the Triveni, which is the confluence of Yamuna Ganga and Saraswati. I I view that as a little bit different. That's an atonement for for fall down of a sannyasi. That's my understanding. Maharaj, maybe you can. Uh, 
mentions, don't do that. He said, don't drown yourself, don't kill yourself. Better to try to purify yourself so that whatever you did, which you want to kill yourself for, the result of that will disappear completely by your good deeds. So better to try to do service that would please Krishna more than you, as you just mentioned, killing his body. It belongs to Krishna. So don't do something unless he himself said, go and do it. That's right. In the case of Chota Haridas, Lord Chaitanya directly said, that's the method of atonement. And Lord Chaitanya was pleased when he did that. But it's different for nowadays sannyasis in ISKCON. In fact, when sannyasis got in trouble, Prabhupada said, stay in the movement somehow. Be Get married like a Madhudrish Maharaj. He had a little, little trouble. He was a great, he did a lot of service for Prabhupada. He was a great soul. So Prabhupada didn't reject him. He said, okay, get married and be a grihasta in Iskan. But don't leave Iskan. That's the base. Don't give up the struggle. The, the famous crocodile, you know, the eighth canto purport. If you can't fight Maya as a sannyasi or brahmachari, then fight Maya as a, as a grihasta. But don't give up the fight. You go on suffering in the subtle world. It's, there's no easy way out. Krishna has made that. So best thing is to work your way out of it as a result of, as you were mentioning, devotional loving service. And don't minimize it. Don't think it can't do anything. It's the greatest thing. It's the only way to become fully God-realized. Devotional loving service. Thank you very much. Thank Shilapal. you very much. Hare Krishna. Should the Prabhupada keep?